Well, we've been talking about flow problems. Okay, I got water here at 100 degrees. So let me call 737 the beginning of this. Unplug that. Because what I want to do What I want to do is graph the temperature of that as a function of time. So I'm going to start at 737 and call it 100 at time t equals 0. And if I can remember, uh, record the time every 5 or 10 minutes. I don't think we're going to get past, well, I mean, 50 minutes takes us to, uh, to our quiz, so we're not going to get past that. Um, so temperature sitting at 100 degrees, the water was boiling, I unplugged it. What's the temperature in the room? Colder. Maybe it's kind of cold. Maybe you need a jacket still. Um, I don't know the temperature in the room. I, we, I could pull that thermometer out there and we could measure it. Let me, let me just guess that the temperature of the room is in the mid-20 degrees, somewhere. Maybe too low, 20, who knows? I don't know how cold it is. So we're going to be aiming at something like 20 degrees C. Eventually, you know that that thing cools off. Why does it cool off? Well, the reason is there's something flowing. And you've, you talked about this something in 7A. This is heat flow. If there's something hot in contact with something at a lower temperature, then heat will flow from the higher temperature to the low. That's coming to equilibrium. That's increasing the entropy of the, of the universe, increasing the entropy of, of, of the stuff right near here. The water loses heat, its entropy goes down. The surrounding air gains heat, its entropy goes up. Its entropy goes up more than the water's entropy goes down. So our, our picture of that is that that happens because it's a statistically likely to happen. It's more likely that the water, that all the energy in there, the thermal energy, will get spread out into the air than that it'll stay right there. The reason in, in 7b, the reason we're going to, or the description we're going to give of this is that the it's caused by a temperature gradient. The temperature outside is different than the temperature inside this water. The temperature inside is 100 degrees. You can see it right there. The temperature outside, well, out here, not more than, I don't know, maybe a few inches away, you can pretty much tell it's back to room temperature. So the, the temperature gradient is between the inside and the outside. The temperature drops. There's a temperature change between the inside and the outside. L is the length over which the temperature changes. It's kind of a complicated problem with in, in reality. The biggest temperature drop is probably across the plastic. Temperature drops a lot from one side of the plastic to the other. <clears throat> the inside of the plastic is, is right around 96 degrees. And, <clears throat> and the outside of the plastic uh, is, is a lot cooler. But I'm not sure how much the temperature drops. I'd have to, we'd have to measure it and try to figure it out. And then the rest of the temperature drop is through the air. So it's a weird kind of a gradient. The temperature 
drops really quickly through a small piece of plastic, and then it drops more slowly as, the, as you get outside the plastic in, in through the air. So there's really two different temperature gradients in this complicated problem. We will not deal in complicated problems like that. By the way, the plastic in the air, series or parallel? The plastic and the air right around this thing. Series. Heat goes through the plastic and then goes through the air. Whatever heat went through the plastic had to go through the, that little surrounding pocket of air also to get to the outside. They're in series. They have different temperature drops because they have different resistances. The plastic is a pretty good resistor. Air, well, air is not a bad resistor either. So bo both of them have a, have a temperature gradient across them. They have different temperature drops, different temperature gradients, because they have different resistances, even though they're in series. So we're at about seven minutes. I'm going to write this in just because I don't want to forget. I'm at 94 in a about seven minutes. <clears throat> fluid flow you already talked about. You know that the reason that fluid, our description of why fluid flows through that horizontal copper pipe in discussion lab, the reason why we say fluid flows, why there's a current in there, is because there's a pressure drop. There's a high pressure on one side, Atmospheric pressure on the other, that, that pressure gradient, that pressure change per unit length causes a current to flow. Voltage gradient, voltage different at two points causes electrical charge to flow. And last time we talked about a concentration gradient causes, well we barely talked about it, but you already know this anyway, a concentration gradient causes particles to flow. These last two, heat flow and particle flow, are both issues of maximizing the entropy. So those happen just by random chance. They always happen the same way because there's so many particles that random chance will always work in the same direction uh, for us un unless we're sit willing to sit here for many, many lifetimes of the universe and wait for random chance to go the other way. But uh, random chance is what causes the heat flow and the particle flow, and it's because there's lots and lots of particles, Avogadro's number of kind of particles, that uh, these statistical issues become the only thing that happens. The other two, charge flow and uh, fluid flow, are caused by actual forces. Something's pushing the fluid. Well, it's the fluid that's behind it. Something's pushing the electrons. Well, it's the electrons that are behind it. So, so something's pushing these things. There are actual forces involved. And, and so there is a difference between these, the top two kinds of flow problems and the bottom two kinds of flow problems. But we can describe them in exactly the same way. That each, the flow happens because of a gradient. And there's always something that's resisting the flow. So there's always a resistance, heat conductance, diffusion constant, something that gives you the current per unit area. This J, here I have actually written it down, J is a current, current per unit area. So I've got a question for you. I'm bringing up this physical problem just because I don't know biology and you do, and so I'm not going to ask you biology questions because I'll just end up getting stumped. But I know that biology deals in competing flow problems a lot. And so I'm going to uh, ask you to think about this one. An electric range usually has several burners. The burners are just a, 
a resistor that's wound around in a circle, and you plug the resistor into the wall. So around a 120 volt outlet connected across this resistor. What happens when you do that? Current flows, the resistor starts getting hot. It gets hotter and hotter and hotter, but, but it doesn't just melt down. It doesn't get as hot enough to, to melt into slag on, your, on the range, fortunately. Um, it has a maximum temperature. Even if you plug it right into the wall and it's not trying to control the temperature at all, there will be a maximum temperature for that burner. It doesn't get hotter than whatever, red hot. What two flow problems are happening here? So, think about the flow problems that are happening here and are leading to this maximum temperature. Talk about it all you want. 